Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're going to talk about EKG in PE. First of all, uh, I wanted to say something about tachycardia and non-specific EKG changes. This is always on the exams. This is no, this series is not about the exams, but what is the most common finding in EK, EKG manifestation of PE? Yeah, we always get this question, and the answer is has traditionally been at least um, tachycardia um, as the commonest. EKG finding. Everyone's heard that. Everyone's seen that on a test. But what actually happened was that uh, as PEs have become more and more diagnosed, as we get mm -hmm. more sensitive techniques of diagnosing it, that larger pool of PEs, not all of them have tachycardia, far less have tachycardia because maybe they're smaller PEs, for example. And so it's sort of up for question as to whether or not tachycardia is still the commonest manifestation. The way I've been teaching it for the past few years is it's probably nonspecific changes, like nonspecific T wave, nonspecific ST segment changes that are probably as or more common than the tachycardia that we all know. So to say it another way, the severity of the uh, patients with PE that we now diagnose are much less severe than they used to be because we can only find the big ones. Now we can find the little small ones and we probably are finding ones that mean nothing and shouldn't be found, but that's a whole other story. So we're going to talk about right axis deviation. We're going to talk about right bundle branch block, which sort of obviously goes with it. We're going to talk about this S1Q3T3, which everybody likes to talk about. I don't think it's that important. We're going to talk about T-wave inversion in the anterior leads. Very important because you can get fooled and go down the wrong pathway. And we're going to talk about this new uh, thing, sort of SD signalization and AVR as a poor prognostic finding. So here is an EKG, Stuart. And it looks normal to me. Could that be from a PA patient? And of course, the answer is yes. Just like for MI, a normal EKG can be consistent with MI. A normal EKG can be consistent with a PE. Probably not a massive MI if it's a normal EKG that's going on in front of you. It's probably not a massive PE that's going on in front of you if it's a normal EKG. But just, you know, that's the fact of the matter. Is it yes? If the, everything else says PE about this patient, that doesn't completely rule it out. Um, so another thing that sort of you brought up there that I think is really important, basically... The EKG in ischemia and the EKG in P and the EKG in a lot of things is much better as a prognostic tool often than a diagnostic tool. So if you have a PE and a normal EKG, you're probably going to do okay. If you have a really bad EKG like we're going to show you, you're not going to do so And, well. and the other cool thing about it is that just like in, in, in coronary syndromes and ACS, the EKG stratifies the treatment. Not only does it mm -hmm. prognosticate, yep. but it stratifies the treatment. We treat STEMIs a certain way. We treat non-STEMIs a certain way. Uh, the same is also emerging with PE where some of the severe signs on EKG are part of the, hey, this is really bad. Maybe they need the thrombolytic right. treatment. That's sort of the way that we're going. It might actually have some treatment benefits as well. So this, this actually is a segue way to what, what this EKG shows, Mel, which is that in patients that have this deep symmetric T-wave inversion through the precordium, that's V1, V2, V3, V4 principally, um, those patients we know from our research have bigger PEs. Those are, that not only does it mean PE, or actually not only is it consistent with PE, but if it is a PE, it tends to be the bigger ones that have that sign. So that's actually pretty helpful. So the reason I really think it's important to talk about this is because for most of my career, I would look at that and go, oh my gosh, that's ischemia. Right. Oh my gosh, that's really bad cardiac disease. Oh my gosh, and not even think about PE. So yes, this could be ischemia. Yes, this could be subadnocardial infarction. Uh, yes, this could be a proximal lesion. But yes, this could also be a PE. Yeah, that's, that's very important. That's why I want to, to sort of that's highlight this. That's very important. And, uh, you know, when we're teaching this, we go through what are the causes of deep symmetrical T-wave inversion as sort of a memory guide. And uh, remember that PE is up there. Uh, you already mentioned the acute ischemic uh, Wellen syndrome, which mm -hmm. is the acute ischemic syndrome that sometimes looks like that, by the way, when they're at rest uh, with not, not having pain. Uh, it's when they have pain and these flip up and look normalish. that's when you think, hey, this must be an acute coronary syndrome because there's these dynamic changes uh, when they do and don't have chest pain. And then the last thing is if this person comes in unconscious with dilated pupils, uh, you, know, you might be thinking about a subarachnoid hemorrhage because that tends to cause these dramatic T-wave inversions the as well. The so-called cerebral T-waves, the yeah. deep symmetric cerebral T-waves. Okay, so um, ST segment elevation in uh, AVR. So we sort of discovered this a few years ago as a really poor prognostic finding in uh, acute coronary ischemia. So it goes like this. If you have ST segment elevation in AVR and you have an EKG that's showing ischemia, particularly throughout the precordium, then this actually portends that you have got a really proximal lesion and you're going to do badly. It also turns out to be true in PE. If you think this person has a PE or they have a PE and they've got this finding of uh, ST segment elevation in AVR, it is also a very poor prognostic finding, much more mortality, much more morbidity, but I didn't even know about this until a few years ago.
So let's be really clear. It's now emerging that ST segment elevation with diffuse ST segment depression everywhere else is a really concerning situation. They might be about to completely occlude their left main or their left anterior descending. We know that that's something we're supposed to be looking out for. And what's amazing is that that same pattern mm -hmm. is completely consistent with a bad PE. And so you're really going to have to go with your clinical picture to see which path you're going down. This could be consistent with both a bad uh, heart attack about to happen as well as a PE that's going on. Excellent. All right. So let's do the next thing which is actually this, um, just a, an article that I found. There's not that many articles on it yet, but you're going to see a whole swath of them coming soon. But it basically says SD segment elevation in AVR in this group of patients that they had, which was about 300 patients, they did way worse if they had this finding on their EKG. So just sort of to hone that in, it is actually evidence-based. Now, S1, Q3, T3, I kind of hate this finding. It's a classic thing that you'll look for on EKG in a PE patient. I don't like it because I find it in a lot of patients without PE and there's patients with PE that it doesn't exist, but you need to know about it because everybody talks about it. So all it is to demystify it, it's very simple, is that an S1 is an S wave in lead one. Uh, Q3 is a Q wave in lead three and uh, T3 is a T wave inversion in lead three. And what does all of this mean? So this is actually, in my mind, just a fancy way of saying that the axis is shifting. And when you block the outflow of blood from the right side of the heart, uh, you get strain on the right side of the heart. This is one of the ways that it shows up on the EKG is a shifting of the axis towards the right. And so if it bugs you that it's S1, Q3, T3, and we all know that when this is studied just on its own, it doesn't necessarily accurately predict that there's a PE there. Most patients that have it don't have a PE. And uh, just like you mentioned, most patients uh, with a PE don't have it. So it's not accurate, but it's just part of the right axis shifts that happens. And basically when you see that the, when you see an S wave starting to emerge in lead one, what it really means is that the axis is shifting towards the right. Remember down in one and up in, in AVF means that we've got a rightward axis. And that's really a, a big part of what this S1, Q3, T3 really is. Yeah. And it's, some people get very confused about what it is and it's nothing more than that. So right axis deviation, we talked about is a sign of right heart strain and so right axis deviation you can take it uh, through here what does that mean where's the heart pointed where are the electricities pointed so the interesting thing here is that the s1 q3 T3, I'm going to let you circle them, that we just talked about is there. Yep. And it just sort of drives home that point that we're making. Um, another way of looking at that is that this uh, uh, voltage is predominantly downward in one. So show them that the voltage of the QRS is predominantly down in one and predominantly uh, up in ABF. Or in, and you might use, some people might use two. And so that's a, a rightward uh, axis shift. Um, and so that's basically just another one of those features of right heart strain. In this, in this patient, there's something else really big going on. If you look at V1 and V2, you can see that those QRSs have widened. There's T wave inversions. And in fact, there's a right bundle, bron uh, run, right bundle branch block pattern developing here. And that, that's another important sign of acute right heart strain. So you got right, you got a big PE, you got right heart strain, your axis starts to move. And you also often get right bundle branch block. And here's uh, just another example. It's actually exactly the same thing to show you all those things again. So you have your RSR pattern in V1, V2, V3. It's starting to widen out. That QRS is getting wider. And you have, again, that T symmetric T wave inversion that you get with bundle branch blocks. And again, you've got the S1, Q3, T3 uh, thing going on here. And again, the axis is predominantly, you know, down in one and up in three and AVF is uh, up. So uh, this all suggests there's just right axis deviation and a right bundle branch block. This heart is under significant strain. So what we covered then was tachycardia, non-specific EKG findings. Normal EKG can be consistent with a PE. Right axis deviation is obviously very important, and these go together with right bundle branch block. You're under strain. You start to change your electrical axis. You start to widen out your QRS. You get that RSR pattern in V1, V2, V3. S1, Q3, T3, you told us, is just basically the same thing again, another way of looking at it. Um, not very specific, not very helpful. Particularly, I think the important thing here is if you've got somebody who comes in with an ankle sprain and they've got that on their EKG, don't do a CT scan of their chest. Actually, don't do an EKG. <laughs> I think it would be the better, the better idea. Yes. Um, T wave inversion in the anterior leads, very important in my mind because I see T wave inversions and I immediately think ischemia, but it could be that this person has a big PE and that you know might change the, your algorithmic approach to this person. And then we now know this new thing, SD segment elevation in AVR is a poor prognostic finding in ischemia 
cardiac ischemia, it's a poor prognostic finding in PE. So these are just some of the things that you might look for on the 12 lead EKG in the PE patient. His name was Swad. My name's Herbert. 13 years in the making. We're back. <laughs>